Well, hello, everyone, and welcome. This is Cynthia Tomain with Interactive Brokers, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar being brought to you by Qplum, um, where Ankit Aswashti is going to be handling, and I'm sorry if I mispronounced that, Ankit, uh, is going to be talking about different data sets to use and avoid in quantitative portfolios. Um, but before we do start that, what I uh, want to do is pass the um, <clears throat> Uh, or welcome, Ji Chen, who is with QPlum, is going to give us a little bit of background about QPlum and also introduce today's speaker. Um, so welcome, Ji, and thanks for joining us. Thank you, Cynthia. Hello, everyone. My name is Ji Chen. I'm a partner and head of client relations here at QPlum. Our speaker today is Ankit Awasti. Ankit is a partner and quantitative portfolio manager at QPlum. He works on building AI-driven investment strategies. Prior to joining QPlum, he was the CEO of a proprietary high-frequency trading firm where he led a team of 40 engineers and data scientists building multi multiple asset classes across global exchanges. Now, QPlum is an AI-driven asset manager using both deep learning and machine learning in its strategy construction. We provide asset management services to RIAs, family offices, and pension funds. We also have an online investing service to directly manage money for individuals and families. We actively manage individual joint IRAs, trust, and LLC accounts. Now to all of our attendees, um, during the course of this presentation, please feel free to submit your questions to us and we will answer them at the end of the presentation. And at, now I will hand over the presentation to Ankit to begin uh, the presentation on data sets to use and avoid in quantitative portfolios. Okay. Hey, so lots to cover, so let's uh, dive right in. Um, so one of the most contentious topics when discussing applications of uh, machine learning in finance is which data sets should one use? Given that machine learning skills are becoming more commonplace and um, access to traditional sources of data is becoming much easier, the race to hire alpha often boils down to race of finding the next valuable source of data. And from my personal experience, quant teams spend a lot of resources in testing and evaluating data sets for use in quantitative portfolios. In this presentation, I want to go over a first principles approach to selecting data sets for use in quantitative portfolios. So let's first fix our investment mandate. So the goal here is to build a high capacity data-driven investment strategy that can scale up to multi-billion dollars. So the goal is not to build something capacity constrained, and that naturally implies certain constraints on the trading behavior of the investment strategy. So something that has a very short trading horizon uh, won't scale well. Similarly, a high trading capac high capacity strategy needs to trade across a large number of liquid securities to ensure scale. Now with, with that uh, investment mandate, let, let's try and see uh, what are the important factors for choosing uh, data sets. So first, let me go over the baseline uh, expectations of data sets that are absolute essential when you are trying to uh, build a scalable high capacity uh, investment strategy. You need to have more than 30 years of end of day price volume data you need to have uh, intraday high frequency data. Now how this is useful um, is with high frequency trading uh, commoditized to a great extent, if you have very naive execution, then it is very hard to come up with uh, scalable uh, investment strategies. You need more than 30 years of macro data. And we'll, we'll come back why uh, macro data is so important. At the end of the presentation, I'll, I'll show why uh, macro data is, is so crucial when trying to uh, build investment strategies. 
and this data you need to have across equity stock indices futures uh, fixed income currencies all asset classes so briefly the outline of the talk is, is as follows I'll, I'll go over a generic learning problem and decompose it in into three parts data set learning problem and and what is the fundamental uh, irreducible error rate then we'll go over what are the factors you need to look at while selecting data sets for investment strategies next we'll touch upon the concerns uh, that can arise uh, while using uh, alternative data sets and uh, finally we'll go over which data sets does qplum use so let's let's take a first principles approach and, and dissect a learning problem essentially it is combination of a data set a learning algorithm and the base error rate so the data set here uh, would mean the set of dependence and the set of independence so so and the learning uh, algorithm would determine the hyperparameters or the functional form that is mapping the independence to the dependence and the base error rate is the irreducible error that is characterized uh, char characteristic of that learning problem so let's look at why that is um, important so Bayes error can also be defined as uh, the irreducible error or the lowest possible error associated with the learning problem. Now this is often very hard to estimate for most practical problems, but it serves as a good benchmark to improve performance. So let's say you know that if for a learning task, the uh, Bayes error rate is uh, 5% or uh, you can achieve up to 95% accuracy and your algorithm only achieves 90%, then you know that there's a room for 5% uh, accuracy. Actually, um, so let, let, let's take a poll question uh, now. So at this time, what we'll do is we'll uh, launch our first poll question. And I'll uh, give everyone a moment to go ahead and uh, answer that. Just give us a moment here. So first poll question is, in your opinion, what will be the principal driver of returns for data-driven investment strategies? So you can select from any one of the following. The first one is alternative data sets. Second one item is deep learning. Third is markets are efficient, buy and hold is the best. And the fourth one is discretionary traders. So we'll let everyone take some um, few moments there to go ahead and um, select their answers. Okay, at this time we'll close the poll question and uh, we'll share the results with you. Um, so it's pretty much majority of people had chosen um, deep learning. Do you have any um, comments on the, the answers, Konkit? I think that that's mostly in line with what I had expected. Uh, if you just see at, at the hiring patterns at most uh, investment firms, uh, most of the job descriptions would have, uh, you know, um, requirements, working experience with, with deep learning methods or analyzing uh, big data sets. So that, that, that's mostly in line with what I had expected. Okay. So. Yeah, so let's, let's get back to discussing Bayes' error. Um, so that is, uh, for a given learning problem, Bayes' error is the lowest possible error for that learning problem. As I mentioned that that serves as a good uh, benchmark for performance. 
but it is very hard to estimate for uh, most learning problems. But for problems which humans are good at, uh, Bayes error can often uh, act as a proxy. So for instance, if the task is to uh, recognize cats in a video or an image, that is something humans are very good at. So you could uh, take human error rate as the base error rate for that uh, learning problem. As I think most of us know, predicting returns or prices is, is a hard problem. The expected R squared is, is, is very, very low. And we'll see that what that implies in terms of uh, the choice of data sets that we should choose for quantitative portfolios. So let's do two experiments. We sample a large number of points, just two dimensional, where uh, X is the independent and Y is a dependent randomly from a bivariate uh, normal distribution. And we make sure that X and Y are totally uncorrelated. Now we divide these points into data sets of N points. And let R be the estimate of maximum correlation. So in other words, this is uh, the irreducible error rate. So for this learning problem, I'm expecting a correlation of let's say 2% or 10% or 50%. So, so that is the uh, value of R here. And I'll call a data set statistically significant if the correlation for that data set is greater than R. So in this first toy experiment, what we'll do is we'll try to see the percentage of statistically significant data sets, how that changes as we change the value of expected uh, maximum correlation. And in the second experiment, we'll see how that percentage changes as the size of the data set changes. So let, let's look at the results. And it, it's not very surprising that if you expect that the learning problem is hard. So for instance, if you your estimate of maximum correlation is as low as 1%, then up to 75% of data sets would appear statistically significant. But when that correlation value goes up to 12, 13, the percentage of statistically significant data sets comes down to almost zero. So problems which are hard in terms of uh, signal to noise ratio is very low, uh, they're much easier to overfit, which is the case with uh, trying to predict expected returns. Similarly, if the size of the data set is very small, then the chances of uh, mistaking a completely random data set as statistically significant is very high. So here, uh, given 1% expected correlation, we see that as the size of the data set increases from 100 to 100,000 points, the chances of a random data set appearing statistically significant goes from 92% to almost zero. So that tells us two things. One, is that when we are looking at hard problems, they're easy to overfit, so we have to be more careful about overfitting. The other thing is, is one way to take care of this overfitting is to have data sets with long histories, with large number of data points, so that we can validate uh, our, our findings. So let's come to the next poll question. So the second poll question is, um, in your opinion, uh, which of these tasks has a lower base error rate? Um, answer A is indoor speech recognition. Second answer is finding, finding cats in an image. Third option is predicting if SPY will move up or down tomorrow. And the uh, fourth option is predicting a market crash, um, draw down more than 20% in a year. So as we've done before, we'll let everyone, uh, give everyone a few moments to go ahead and uh, submit their responses.
Okay, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, close the poll right now and uh, share the results with everyone. And an overwhelming number of you have uh, selected uh, option two, which is finding cats in an image. And I'll let uh, Ankit go ahead and um, provide some comments on that. Yeah, I mean, so this is expected in the sense that finding cats in an image sounds like the easiest job here. Um, but and I'm surprised how many people feel confident that they'll be able to uh, predict whether SPY uh, can go up or down, or, or or rather be able to predict a market crash. That that seems higher than what I I would have thought. So um, let's get back to our presentation. So now let's let's go over the factors that we need to uh, take into consideration while selecting a data set. So when selecting a data set, we need to make sure that it is clean and reliable. And I'll, I'll come to uh, why that matters and, and what that entails later. Has high coverage. By coverage, I mean, uh, it should have a bearing on a large number of securities. So there could be uh, very niche data sets which affect, let's say, one or two stocks. And when you're trying to build scalable, high capacity investment strategies, uh, that is not enough. So you would ideally want to pick a data set that has high coverage, has long history. I think we've already uh, sort of discussed enough why long history is important. And is predictive over long horizons. Why predictability over long horizons is important is, is if something, some alpha is very short lived, let's say something like a high frequency trading alpha, then I need to be able to turn over my positions within a very short period of time to realize that alpha and thereby causing my capacity of the strategy to go down significantly. So let's, let's go into each of these uh, factors in more detail. Data cleaning. Data cleaning is, is, is very important. So first thing that comes to mind is we should address any look ahead bias that might be there. Even if your trading strategy is, is walk forward, is uh, taking care of the look ahead bias, sometimes this look ahead bias can creep in because of the data sets you're using. So before you kind of roll up your sleeves and try out uh, fancy modeling techniques, it is very important to make sure that the data doesn't have any inherent look ahead bias. So one very uh, obvious example is, is macro data. So let's say job number, jobs numbers. Often they get revised many months uh, later. And if your data set is not using point in time uh, announcements of those job numbers, you will have a look ahead bias. So let's say jobs number for June came out uh, 200,000. And in July, they revise it to 250,000. Now when you're back testing your strategy, if you're seeing 250,000 instead of 200,000, then you're looking ahead. Similarly, often data sets have some sort of normalization based on uh, the historical range of the values uh, that are seen. And, and that can also uh, lead to uh, a look ahead bias. Filling missing data carefully. This is very, very important. Often you find data sets with, with a lot of missing entries. And with what data should we, with what default value should we uh, fill that uh, missing and those missing entries is, is very crucial. So let's say uh, if I'm uh, filling uh, missing data for returns, zero would be uh, a good way to uh, fill those values versus when I'm um, filling missing data for prices, I would not use zero. I would rather use the previous value. So there, there could be examples where you'd want to use a moving average of last five instances rather than just the previous value. And, and there could be values where you don't want to assume a number. So you just want to say that this is an invalid entry and, and use it as it is and not 
sort of fill that number with something that you'd have to act on later. Detecting outliers is, is very important. And I, I think it's, it's a very non-trivial problem as well. Because in finance, one is almost always looking for uh, anomalies. How do you distinguish between a surprise value and an absurd value? And depending on the application, uh, I think it is important to determine where that boundary is. As in what is a sane data point versus what is an absurd data point and, and therefore remove it from your analysis. For instance, if my model says that S&P will go down by 5%, and there's another instance where my model says this S&P will go down by 10%. So for me, both of these numbers are very high. And I can safely say that anything above 5% or even 3%, I will consider it as absurd. Similarly, you could think of, um, macro data as well. So let's say um, in my historical data, I have jobs numbers put as zero or, or um, and that is a total outlier in the sense that you're seeing numbers in 100,000 and suddenly you see a number zero or a negative number or an invalid entry. It is very important to rule that out from your analysis. Another way it affects uh, your backtested results is that you could have actually a one big outlier, which is not an error on the part of the data set, but it's just a very uh, different number from others. And that can lead to very high positive returns just for that data point. And you have a lot of small, small negative returns. Again, it is important to see uh, sort of cross validate your uh, results across different samples of uh, data points to make sure that you're not banking on results of one um, outlier. Increasingly, a lot of uh, data sets are being used in a completely automated fashion. And in light of that, it is very important to clean your real-time data feed. So let's say you're expecting non-farm uh, payrolls data. And because of some issue at the data provider's end, you, you get a value of zero. Now, unless you have uh, some sanity check at your end, you might think that you know this is much lower than expected and act uh, accordingly. And, and that, as you all know, can lead to uh, disastrous results. Next, we come to high coverage. So as I earlier mentioned, coverage refers to the stocks or asset classes, the data set, has a bearing on. For instance, a very niche data set like that of uh, satellite images of parking lots of a large retail store um, like, like Macy's or JCPenney's would have little effect on the prices beyond that stock or its peers. It is important to realize that smaller the coverage, smaller is the scale of the potential alpha there. Moreover, smaller coverage can also lead to very concentrated bets. And the required alpha per stock needs to be higher. So when I, so the good things with high coverage is, is that it leads to better diversification. I can, uh, even if I'm wrong in a bunch of uh, securities, I can make it up by being right in a number of other securities. It is robust to overfitting in the sense that if you're using the same model across all the securities, then essentially you have multiplied your data set by the number of securities. 
and it naturally leads to uh, higher capacity longer history longer history as we've already discussed that it reduces the chances of overfitting significantly once you have long history then you can uh, also explore very uh, sophisticated learning methods like deep learning which are very highly parameterized and data hungry and require a large number of data points to uh, to fit the other thing that is important is, is what is the hypothesis or relationship one is after so if you want to learn a linear relationship one doesn't need a lot of uh, data to come up with a statistically significant estimate whereas if you are trying to learn a highly parameterized uh, function the number of instances needed uh, would be higher the other way longer history helps is it helps you analyze whether the risk premium of this data set is persistent over time or not and with a lot of alternative data sets alpha dk is a problem as we'll discuss later so longer history helps us validate that the alpha in this data set is persistent the other thing way it helps is uh, if the data set covers uh, the likely scenario that can appear in out of sample data then it is it is better so for instance most of the recent alternative data sets would not have coverage going back to uh, 2008 financial crisis where price volume data and macro data uh, cover more than 50 years spanning multiple economic uh, regimes So this is um, a chart showing. So we have mapped uh, data sets on on two dimension. Uh, so one, the y-axis here is is the coverage of the data set, and um, and the x-axis here is the history of the data set as you can see that data sets like satellite images and all they might you know intuitively feel that they're very uh, useful but they don't have long history for you to uh, use a lot of fancy models with whereas the absolute necessities that we discussed at the beginning of the presentation were the price volume data the, that is the microstructure data as presented here and the federal macro data is at the top right corner it has the longest history and it has the highest coverage and that is one of the reasons why it is uh, it lends itself very easily to more sophisticated learning methods So next we'll uh, go over the concerns um, that can arise while using uh, alternative data sets. We'll go over alpha decay, uh, overfitting, uh, the possibility of learning spurious relationships, lack of transparency is there, and uh, escalating costs I believe is, is one of the factors that is not highlighted enough. And, and there could be compliance uh, related concerns as well uh, while using alternative data sets. So let's, let's discuss alpha DK in more detail. So firstly, the data sets uh, that deliver alpha over a high coverage are extremely rare. And the alpha DK is to some extent inevitable. Information dissemination in currently is in instant and keeping a profitable data set under wraps is uh, impossible and when such a data set becomes mainstream that alpha vanishes 
and as barrier to using data sets is coming down and more and more firms are becoming uh, capable of processing uh, large quantities of data. The life cycle of alpha generating data sets is becoming increasingly small. And therefore, the quant firms need to constantly look for new edge-worthy data sources. And a bulk of the time in quant firms is spent on trying to analyze data sets for relevance. Uh, Next, we look at uh, how it can affect, uh, like what, what are the overfitting uh, issues that can arise with use of alternative data sets. Firstly, most of the data sets have uh, short histories. So methods like walk forward optimization um, become infeasible. Data sets evolve drastically over time, especially uh, alternative data sets. So, if you imagine something like a Twitter sentiment data. Now the number of tweets itself has been exponentially growing up. Um, and how that data set has evolved over time, it, it's very hard to predict. So something that was relevant yesterday might not be relevant today or not to the same extent or not in the manner that it was earlier. One way to address uh, overfitting with short history data sets is high frequency uh, sort of sampling data at a lower frequency and trying to uh, predict at a lower uh, trading horizon. But that essentially just reduces your capacity. And the other problem is that most of the uh, recent machine learning advances have come from methods like deep neural networks. And these require a lot of data in order to be successful. And with short histories, a lot of these alternative data sets are simply not amenable to um, such methods. One of the reasons skeptics of machine learning want to get a feel for the trading decisions, and rightly so, uh, is the fear of learning spurious relationships. So this is an instance where uh, it even uh, caught the eyes of popular media, where um, apparently Anna Hathaway uh, was driving the results of uh, returns of uh, Berkshire Hathaway stock. The hope is that as firms become more and more adept at handling new data sets and, and learning algorithms can become more transparent in their uh, decision making. So if you see here, basically what the uh, author of this article is claiming is that these uh, automated learning bots somehow discovered this relationship that whenever um, Anna Hathaway movies get released and the sort of tag Hathaway becomes more popular, Berkshire Hathaway stocks go up. And he claims that this sounds more than a coincidence here and, and therefore could be because of these bots actually trading up these stocks at times when these movies come out. I believe, uh, um, actually it's, it's after this slide. Escalating cost. So the cost of just the data sources is, is uh, expected to go beyond $2 billion. And um, I believe the fate of firms which are simply trying to get the, uh, you know, uh, alpha by utilizing um, more and more alternative data sets is going to be similar to uh, the high frequency trading landscape where simply the cost of infrastructure keeps going up and it becomes untenable. So small firms have absolutely no chance of competing and larger firms also are feeling the crunch. And with the issues we discussed like alpha decay, life cycles becoming smaller and smaller over time, um, 
I believe the end would look very similar to uh, what has happened in high frequency trading in the sense that it has gotten very commoditized. The other issue here is that uh, most of these uh, infrastructure costs are, are directly passed to allocators. And, and therefore, uh, when you think of it in terms of the fee structure that is charged by um, investment firms, and, and to be honest, not with the ample returns, this is one of those causes. I think, yeah, so next I think we can go to the... Sure, so at this time what we'll do is I'll launch the, uh, the uh, third poll question. And um, in your opinion, what is the single most important concern when working with alternative data sets? And the option number one is overfitting. Second option is alpha decay. Third option is lack of transparency. And the um, fourth option is escalating costs. And uh, we also have a, um, a fifth option, which is uh, compliance, which didn't make it there. So we'll give it uh, everyone um, a few moments to go ahead and um, submit their responses. Okay, everyone, thank you. Um, thank you, and we'll close the poll now and uh, share the results with everyone. And it uh, seems to be the um, most popular one is uh, overfitting. What's your take on that? Okay. No, so, so, sounds fair. I, I believe as well that overfitting is, um, as a quant, that is the single uh, most important concern I have when, when trying to evaluate data sets. Uh, and um, you can never be too careful when it comes to overfitting. Okay, we'll go ahead and now uh, go back to the presentation here. So let's uh, discuss which data sets does Qplum use. And as I mentioned that we've gone over a number of data sets and evaluated them for uh, whether there's a persistent alpha there, can we uh, use it to uh, come up with uh, multi-asset solutions? And, and this is what we have found useful. End of day price volume data is, is absolutely necessary. High frequency take data is important to optimize your execution pipeline. And I'll, I'll come back to why uh, it could be um, useful for other reasons. We have more than 50 years of macroeconomic data. And when I talk about macroeconomic data, so let's just uh, take the example of the jobs numbers. The headline number is, is the number of jobs added or the unemployment rate. But if you actually look through the uh, report that comes out of Department of Labor every month, that has more than 200 data points. And every one of those points is important in some or the other way. Things like wage growth, things like participation rate, all those are important indicators of uh, economy. And I believe not much work has been done to um, utilize those uh, aspects of uh, the macro data that is there. The last is uh, 
more than thousand years of hypothetical price volume data and we'll, we'll go over our use of hypothetical data in a future webinar but the reason this is important is it allows us to freely use um, the state-of-the-art machine learning methods to come up with uh, to influence investment strategies and as we have discussed often in our uh, investment methodology we the way we use deep learning is is not only to predict returns it's also to summarize the market is to understand the structure of uh, how different securities move with each other and that is something that can be leveraged from uh, high frequency data as well for instance so one could repurpose high frequency data and generate hypothetical data to augment your uh, data set and that becomes more amenable to uh, use of uh, deep learning methods L let's do the final question i guess all right so we'll go ahead and launch the final poll question and um, in your opinion um, on a scale of uh, one through five, five being um, very bullish, how bullish are you on the use of alternative data sets for making high capacity investment strategies? So all the attendees have an option to choose between um, between one through five, and uh, we'll give everyone a few moments to go ahead and make that selection. Okay, we'll go ahead and uh, close the poll right now and uh, share the results with everyone. And um, yeah, over number, um, pretty high number of uh, folks uh, selected pretty much the medium, which is <laughs> no opinion in that front. And um, so this is not very controversial. Okay, okay we'll go back to um, the presentation. So that, that's it on the presentation and uh, please feel free to uh, keep keep sending your uh, questions and uh, now we'll take some time to answer some of the questions that we already have. Okay, so the first question comes from uh, Kaushik and his question is, I'm not clear why 30 years of end of day data is needed. That means about 7,500 data points. Is that related to the number of stocks in the universe? So it, it's not uh, related to the number of stocks in the universe. 30 years of end of day data is needed because it spans multiple economic regimes. Obviously more would help, um, but um, making sure that your strategy has seen enough uh, economic regimes, inflationary periods, disinflationary periods, um, I think having more data is, is having at least 30 years of data is, is crucial. Okay, we'll go ahead and um, answer the second question um, that came on. And this one comes from uh, Daniel. Um, his question is, regarding deep learning, what would be the most common way in which it is being being used in the financial industry? I assume current um, recurrent neural networks to predict price movements. So yes, recurrent neural networks, I believe, uh, lend themselves most easily uh, to uh, financial time series. But um, 
from personal experience, even something like, you know, auto encoders for summarizing uh, data sets. Traditionally, people have used uh, principal component analysis. Um, so even very naive models like auto encoders uh, tend to do very well um, when sort of trying to summarize the data sets in, in fewer number of dimensions. Uh, interestingly, uh, I'm not sure if a lot of people have tried the uh, reinforcement learning, but that seems to uh, be a very uh, up and coming topic, which has been used in a lot of uh, partially observable time series uh, data sets. So it would be interesting uh, to see if something like that comes along. Okay, so at this time we'll go to another question, and um, we could uh, we have a question from um, Jackie. Question is: uh, Micro data has been there for a long time. Long time. Why do you think that it? Why do you think that there's any alpha left? So this is something that I uh, alluded to earlier in the presentation as well that although macro data has been there for a long time, um, it has not been uh, used well, partly because let's say people have ignored uh, the other data points other than the headline numbers. And macro data is very slow moving. And most of the times when we are talking about alternative data sets, people are trying to be faster. How can I get information that is faster than the other source? And it has uh, bearing on very large uh, asset classes. And the gestation period of macro data is, is much higher. So for instance, um, payroll numbers are predictable over six months, like are indicative of a crisis six months ahead. Um, if you were to simply just see what is uh, the trend of payroll data versus uh, how is the economy doing, you, you could see that it is predictable over the next six months. So I think that, so I think that, that sort of uh, longer horizon predictability of macro data has kept a lot of people away from it. But when it comes to building scalable multi-asset um, Investment strategy, uh, it, is, it is very crucial. So our next question comes from uh, David. Um, his question is, uh, with so much effort having been placed on high frequency data and the shrinkage of alpha as a result, what time horizon for return forecast do you consider to be the sweet spot for quantitative methods at the present time? In my opinion, that depends on your investment mandate. Uh, so firstly, it is important to uh, look at high frequency trading as a phenomena. It is important to acknowledge that in any uh, investment strategy, be it a long-term investment strategy. So even if I'm trying to predict prices uh, over a month and uh, my turnover is, is one month, high frequency trading is important because I need to optimize my executions if I have to build something that is high capacity. Coming back to your question, I, I believe it, it, it almost always depends on your uh, investment mandate. Very short horizons are obviously becoming very, very competitive and is mostly um, an infrastructure game at this point. But there is a lot of opportunity um, even an intraday, uh, trying to predict three hours, five hours, or, or um, a week ahead. But again, the shorter horizon you, you pick, the more capacity constraint is your strategy going to be. So uh, we have another question from uh, Nikhil, and the question is, uh, is hypothetical price volume data, uh, are we talking about Monte Carlo simulation? 
So Monte Carlo simulation is one way to uh, generate hypothetical data. See, you have to realize that hypothetical uh, data needs to be representative of actual financial data as well. And there are some stylized facts uh, in, in financial time series. For instance, there is, uh, if you have a naive uh, multivariate normal distribution that you're sampling for from, that is not going to lead to, let's say, volatility clustering. Now, what you do is you go back and make, uh, come up with a more complicated model that, that addresses that. Then there could be other issues, like, uh, for instance, uh, there's, there's leverage effect in uh, financial time series that volatility of an asset class is inversely proportional to its returns. So Wix is inversely proportional to uh, SPY returns. Let's say you go back and you come up with a model that addresses that as well. Now there are other uh, things that are very common in financial uh, time series data that when um, volatility increases, the cross correlation across uh, asset classes uh, increases as well. So in times of financial distress, you'll see that everything becomes much more correlated. How do you address that? And for that, we have seen that high frequency data to a large extent is able to mimic a lot of these uh, properties of uh, daily data and thereby serving as a good source of uh, hypothetical data for uh, deep learning applications. Okay. So that, that depends on the data set. And from what I have seen is shorter the history of the data set. Less is the life cycle. Obviously, if it is a very niche data set that probably no one else has access to, um, then that's a different story. Uh, but, but mostly, uh, I think more persistent alpha is, is either um, low on coverage or um, it, it, it is very short lived. Okay, so at this time we will, um, as we have time for one more last question, one more question, and um, we will uh, go through. So, just give us a moment. Yeah, I'm trying to, to uh, get so, a question that is more relevant for the discussion. Okay. So. Okay. So that's an interesting question. When evaluating different uh, investment strategies. Uh, what performance metrics does QPlum consider? This comes from us, Samuel. So we look at um, returns, of course. We look at sharp values. We look at all the um, relevant metrics that um, drawdown, worse drawdowns. Uh, but the important thing is how we evaluate uh, the back-tested results. So all of our uh, evaluation pipeline is, is walk forward in nature. So when you're simulating a strategy for the day, we make sure that the strategy has no knowledge of any data on that day or any day ahead. So that makes the backtested results much more reliable. The other thing is that we, we are not shooting for a sharp strategy our uh, investment mandate is is very similar to what i stated in the beginning of the presentation is 
efforts to come up with scalable high capacity strategies that can easily deploy uh, multi billion dollars and that naturally uh, places certain constraints and and, and therefore we evaluate for uh, performance in hypothetical data in in under different kind of monte carlo simulations under stress periods whether the whether the returns are coming up from from one strategy or is it uh, multiple strategies contributing to the returns are there outliers in terms of returns so so there's a lot of uh, ways we try to sort of deconstruct the process uh, the decision making process by the deep learning strategies in order to make sure that they make sense to us okay um so we'll try to i know you guys have uh, many of your sunny questions so we'll uh, have time we'll just uh, answer one more question before this uh, end of this um this webinar so the last question comes from david and this question is as a multiple of the time horizon of the forecast would you consider to be the minimum amount of time required to validate an approach out of sample so that i believe again depends on um, how much back tested data you have and how how confident are you of that alpha so and, and this is a bleed that almost uh, if you're uh, using alternative data sets you have to live with it uh, in the sense that alpha decay is inevitable so when you deploy your uh, strategy in real you will find that the alpha in real is is smaller than what you had in back testing but if that is systematically different higher or lower than what you had back tested then i think you need to go back to the drawing board and and realize that uh, that either the alpha is gone or there was overfitting or or something of that uh, nature okay so um that uh pretty much uh, con um, concludes our uh, uh q a uh, portion of the webinar so uh on behalf of Ankit, we want to thank you all again for joining us today for any attendees who are registered investment advisors family offices or pension funds uh, please know that qplum offers actively managed portfolios at a flat fee please feel free to send any queries to uh, contact at qplum.co and uh, we also look forward to having you join us next month um, on July 17th, where Masi Singhal, uh, co-founder and CEO of QPlum, will be presenting on active investing versus buy and hold. Cynthia, I will now hand over the closing remarks over to you. Thanks, everyone. Well, G and Ankit, thank you so much for today's presentation. And as G was just mentioning, we do have another webinar coming up on July 17th, where we'll uh, where we actually will have access uh, or presenting that day is Q Plum's co-founder and current CEO, um, who will be talking about active investing. Uh, versus buy and hold. Uh, that event is listed on the Interactive Broker website underneath the education menu. You'll find the webinars link and can locate uh, registrations uh, for that, e that upcoming event. Um, so with that, we are going to conclude our session here today. I've got to thank all of you for participating with us this afternoon. Uh, we do appreciate the time that you have spent. Um, we also have been recording today's event, and I'll be sending out a direct link to the recorded playback soon after this session ends. It will include not only a direct link to the playback, but also to the slides that have been used for today's presentation. So with that, we are going to conclude our session today. You can exit using the X in the upper right-hand corner of the screen. Thanks, all. <clears throat> Have a great rest of your day. And special thanks to QPlum for today's presentation. Um, <clears throat> thanks, everyone. Have a great day.